Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to So Very Wrong About Games. I'm your co-host, a man whose best days are gone, Mark Bigney, and with me, as always, is my good friend, a man whose best days are when I am gone, Michael Walker. How you doing, Walker? Fantastic. Right off the bat, we just want to stress, although this is not going to be a regular feature of So Very Wrong About Games, we meant what we said, we're not going to bother you all the time about Patreon, but we would be remiss if we did not mention how incredibly grateful we are to, number one, all of our listeners who show up each and every week to revel in how incorrect we are about so many things, but also to the people who've decided to pony up and become swaggers. We are literally overwhelmed by the support. We are very, very grateful, and there's going to be more news, and indeed some of your special features are going to be rolling out soon. Do you want to express any gratitude, Mark, or just sit there no, stone-faced? No, I'm just, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just blown away, Mark. Like I said, I, we never expected this much stuff, and I'm just overjoyed that uh, we're going to be able to spruce the place up. So as a result, we are going to talk about games this week. We're going to talk about our Eurus, the as-yet-unnamed review intro segment. We're going to talk about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news, why it doesn't matter. We're going to talk about our feature game this week, which is Gloomhaven, a little-known indie published design. And then we're going to have our topic of the week, which is how much can a de- game demand of its players? So right off the bat, let us speak of our Eurus, which was Sidereal Confluence, trading and negotiation in the Elysian Quadrant. I play it every day. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is, Walker, correct me if I'm wrong, you have not played it since we reviewed it that last year. That is correct. Year. I have not played it, nor and have I had the urge to play it. I will say this. I've played it several times since we reviewed it last time, and I stand by everything I said. It, it's a marvelous, marvelous game for people with a refined, sophisticated gaming palette, people with better taste in games than they do with company. But that having been said, I've had a very difficult time getting it to the table. Walker is not alone in not enjoying it. It is not for everybody. Two hours of solid haggling is not really everyone's cup of tea, but I adore the game. I think everything about it is wonderful. Yeah, there's no nothing mechanically wrong in my mind about it, but just like you said, the, the two full hours of constant negotiation, I think, is just a bit much. I have noticed, though, and we're going we're gonna to circle back to this in a moment, I think, that the more I play what one might call social games with you, Walker, you tend to sort of sit back and... By the time you decide to engage with what's happening, things have already passed you by, and you don't tend to find that very agreeable. So that, I don't that, or I just make deals with I, with the people I feel got left out. Sure, but <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that in certain kinds of games, you don't actively insert yourself so as to take control of the situation. Which, That's correct. Which many social games kind of sort of require, and Serial Confluence is very much one of those games. No one, no, people might come chasing after you for whatever goods you have, but you really do have to be active and say, "I need those black cubes. What are you going to give me for them?" Et cetera, et cetera. For sure. Anyway. So let's talk about games we played last week. What did you play last week, Walker? I got to play Mombasa. It's fairly high up on the BGG list. I've never even played it before. and I, it, It's a, definitely a Euro game, but it seemed as though there was an awful lot going on. I've only played it once, so I don't want to give too much you know, into it, but it seemed like there was an awful lot of things going on that were unnecessary. But what I did like it, unlike Food Chain Magnet, where when you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get crushed and crushed badly and not do well. And there's not very much of a window to say, this is what I'm going to concentrate on this game and have fun doing that. You, There's a little bit that in, in like other games, but I found a way to do this in Mombasa. It's like, okay, I'm going to concentrate on diamonds and then just watch other people do this other stuff. And, and it worked out all right. So, you know, I still had fun. I still came close. And I like games like that where you can, it has the one mechanism that you can sort of concentrate and just sort of watch the other things going on and, and you know, explore those next time you play it. You know who designed Mombasa, right? No. Alexander Pfister, he of Great Western Trail. There you go. I, I agree with you for what it's worth. It's striking that you fault Mombasa for having a little bit too much going on than it needed for a Euro game a little bit busier than it needs to be because that's very much the sort of dominant Euro game aesthetic and style, of, certainly of the past five years. Things like Teotihuacan, things like Great Western Trail, tracks upon tracks upon tracks and 17 different kinds of action spaces and iconography all over the place. And while there are some games like that that I do enjoy, all things being equal, I prefer your cleaner designs, I prefer your more streamlined stuff – when it comes to Euro management games. So I find it I find it interesting that you... Well, Tate to Walken is all, you know, you are building the pyramid and everything sort of funnels into doing that. There are tons of sure. other things you can do. And much like I said with Great Western Trail, there's the same sort of thing in Great Western Trail. You can concentrate on just one part of it and still, you know, have fun doing it. Probably not win, but still come close. You know, I'm going to do this great herd and concentrate on doing that and you'll still do well. And yet, strangely enough, I seem to recall my faulting the expansion for not really making that viable... And you maintained that it was still the ideal way to play. Anyhow. 
Obviously, I don't want to overgeneralize. I'm not saying that if you if you fault Mombasa for being overcomplicated, you have to dislike any of these other things. That is certainly not what I'm getting at. But I, I, I do think you're right, and I think you're right to identify that as definitely a design element common in Alexander Pfister designs. That's all. I get to play Decrypto, and uh, this is by Tamal Dagenet de l'Esperance by uh, Le Scorpion Max Ski last year. And there was a mild controversy, actually, when you, in our end-of-year roundup, identified Decrypto as one of your most disappointing experiences of the year. And I, when I say mild controversy, what I mean is that there's a petition several thousand strong calling for your head in vast tracts of BGD land. And I will say that having played Decrypto now with the proper rules and with everybody working on the same page... I think more or less what we said about it was on point. Namely, that it is a more clever game than Codenames, but it is less fun than Codenames. And it is not what we are looking for in a game of that type. When it comes to a word game involving, you know, three to maybe ten players sitting around a table, what I don't want is a relatively silent, staid affair with fixed turns where everyone's frowning and looking at things to try to be clever. I would much rather have a loud, raucous experience where we're all talking about clever connections and making wordplay jokes and so on and so forth. And so while I appreciate the gaminess elements of Decrypto, I still think that it scratches a similar itch to code names. And when it comes to large numbers of people playing with words, I would much rather do something like code yeah. names. Like I said, I think it just gets to the same conclusion at the end, but takes the super scenic route. That is unnecessary. So Decrypto, I enjoyed, but I appreciate what it's doing. It's just not really serving to satisfy what I'm looking for in an experience like that. And that was that. that's how I feel about Decrypto. Played another game of Han on the topic of Euro games that I'm looking for. I really do like area majority games, and Han is one of the, the best ones that I've played. This is the redevelopment of a game called China, which in turn was the redevelopment of a game called Web of Power. I've talked about it before. This is by Michael Schacht. And I really do think that in terms of super fillers, games that take roughly the same length of time as fillers and don't add relatively rules light but have really, really satisfying player interaction, really satisfying tactical and strategic decisions, Han is probably one of the best, certainly that I've played in the past five years. And I should really play more early majority games. I should play more El Grande. I should play more Han. I should play more games like that because I really do think that it is one of the best ways to do conflict in a Euro setting that doesn't run afoul of a lot of the standard conflict problems, be they thematically or mechanically. You don't tend to have well-done ones don't have kingmaker problems if the scoring is remotely clever and Euro games tend to have clever scoring. It's one of the things that you can rely on. Anyhow, all this to say that I've enjoyed Han a great deal and I should be playing more early majority. I've been meaning to play Sakura Arms again for quite some time. I talked about how I printed out a lot of the Japanese-only expansions, the English translations that are available on the Discord channel. And this is under the new Shinmaku edition, which is apparently the tournament standard in Japan. I was in no way disappointed. The new characters are really fun. We played with some of the simpler ones. There's a poisoner. There's somebody who manipulates shadow. There are a couple other ones that are really, really broke. There's one with a transforming motorbike and who generates weird effects. And we didn't play with those. That was a little too... We were just getting back into Sakura Arms, so we didn't want to jump into the deep end. And uh, they, for what it's worth, those two characters are also an expansion that seems to have decided to undo everything I've said about Sakura Arms not having particularly objectionable art. These are uh, rather boob-heavy uh, as, as far as character goes, so we avoided them. And I really like all the changes. I like all the new characters. I will note one thing just as a minor aside. One of the characters that I really, really, really enjoyed from the base set, namely Takoyo, uh, she had some balance changes from various editions, and I was hoping that that would really bring her in line. I'm not in a position to really comment because I was reflecting on this. She still seems really, really strong. She's got a lot of effects that uh, automatically do damage to life, which is a very difficult thing to do in Sacker Arms. She has a lot of really interesting counters and a lot of other things. And I realized that maybe she's still too strong, but it's also hard for me to comment because in many ways, of all the sort of asymmetric characters in the world of board and card games, she's perhaps the one most calibrated to my natural play style, which is to say very slow, deliberative, plodding. That's not P-L-O-T-T-I-N-G. That's P-L-O-D-D-I-N-G. I plod. I am a plodder. And that's exactly what she does. She just slowly chips away at things, and she has things built in for endurance the way that other characters don't. And that's exactly what I like to do in games. So I'm not really able to say if she's too strong or too weak. All that I know is that she's exactly how I want to play all the time, which is uh, perhaps weak. Anyway, so uh, I'm very, very pleased with all the new Sakuram stuff. It's a crying shame that AEG isn't releasing any of it in English, but there is a community out there supporting it, so it's it's to be had if you want it. So support AEG as much as you can, and then for all the rest of the stuff, you can find it later. And that was Sakura Arms. So I had a super crazy week, so I didn't get to play very much. 
but I did get back to Kitchen Rush. I know I already talked about it, but this was a full four-player game, and it was just as crazy and chaotic as I knew it would be and was super fun. It is a game where you're running a restaurant, you know, rushing around trying to get all these ingredients and cook at the right number of times and make sure your, you know, your stock room's full and your people are paid, and it's a great, fun game. Still haven't played it. Well, we'll have to give it a try. Still looking forward to trying Kitchen Rush played a game of Chinatown for the first time in what seems like many, many years. And there's a reason for that. Chinatown is a negotiation game that was put out uh, right around the turn of the century, actually. And I don't think it's dated, actually, in terms of how streamlined it is. I think it's 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 stood the test of time very well. I've just never liked Chinatown. I've never... It, it, it's not really calibrated to what I want out of a negotiation game. Have you ever played Chinatown? Yes, I have. And what, what are your thoughts on Chinatown? Oh, it just seems... It was adequate for what it did. For what it sets out to do, I think it did a great job. It doesn't overstay its welcome. You know, it's the same sort of thing. You're really waiting for those particular numbers, and when you probably don't get them, you'll just, you know, make sure you have a good bank so you can trade to get the ones you want. I agree. In one sense, I agree that it doesn't overstay its welcome because it's reasonably brisk. But on the other hand, I really think that it does overstay its welcome, and, and, and here's why. And here's what I don't like about Chinatown, because it's a huge classic, and a lot of people love it, and it's very popular in a local area. The early stages, I think, are far too random, and I don't object to the randomness necessarily because, as I've commented in the past, trading games some, need some degree of asymmetry, otherwise you're not going to trade. If you're self-sufficient or if everybody's equally starved, nobody's going to trade anything because they can't. And I've played trading games like that. It's unpleasant. Chinatown just introduces random properties, not unlike Monopoly, and I don't mean that as a dig. It's just that's how Monopoly introduces properties into the system, even when you are auctioning. And... That part can be very swingy, but then it segues from the from the beginning game into the mid game, and then in the mid game everything becomes overly deterministic. So in Chinatown, I find it gets both end of the spectrum. It's either too random, and when it ceases being random, it's too deterministic. Right around the mid game of Chinatown, you can look at the board, you can look at the tiles, and say, "Okay, I know what that thing is worth exactly. I know exactly how many dollars that thing is worth." And in environments like that, trading is not interesting. If I know for a fact that it's going to be worth 50 grand to you, I'm not interested in haggling over the details about, you know, rounding in favor of somebody else or, or, or one person or another, you know, trying to figure out who's in the lead because I can't do even trades with them. I have to get a, take, get one over on them. I can do uneven trades with you because you're losing. That kind of gamey stuff I'm, I'm not particularly looking forward to. I like it when the trading is fast and loose and where, every, where you can escape the zero-sum game. But when everything is calculable, the zero-sum game rears its ugly head very, very, very strong. Anyhow, that's not the kind of negotiation that I like, and I find that Chinatown leans into that a little little bit too heavily. If the randomness were evened out and or if there were a little bit of uncertainty, not necessarily randomness, but uncertainty on the part of how things were going to pay out or when, then maybe. But as it is, it's just not not particularly to my taste. Finally, got a chance to try Eclipse with the new second edition rules. This, again, is by the uh, expert contribution of people on BoardGameGeek who have backported as much of the second edition rules into the first edition as, as they can. There are excellent files available to print your own stickers that can cover up components to alter the technology costs and alter the various elements of various sector tiles, so on and so forth. Eclipse is sort of the Euro 4X game to beat. And I've been a reasonably large fan of it ever since it was first released. I didn't pledge for the second edition, though, because I object to paying more money for a new edition with something that has fewer features than the version I already have. The version I already have has a lot more races than is available in the second edition. Maybe when those races are available, I will pony up for the second edition. Until then, though, I get to benefit from the balance changes for free, which seems like a great deal to me. Maybe I'm being exploitive of the publishers. I don't know. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. Feel free to call me a heartless monster. That's all right with me. Anyhow, I thought that all the balance changes were wonderful, uh, in particular some of the age-old complaints against computers, against plasma missiles, against the starting positions being uh, un unfortunately weighted in favor of somebody else. A lot of those were immediately improved even on first play. We saw much more heavily, heavy investment in shields. Shields were very, very important, as were computers. Uh, missiles didn't seem overpowered. The money bonus for passing first, the eight rounds instead of nine, everything was for the good. I couldn't point to any of the changes that we experienced to say, I think that's a little suspect or dodgy. At best, they were. I didn't have an opinion on them, or they seemed to be really, really helpful for the game. There were a couple of new players that seemed to really enjoy Eclipse. There were some veterans that 
seemed to appreciate some of the changes or at least didn't object to it too strongly. Anyway, had a great time. I'm very much looking forward to see what other changes become apparent in the second edition, bringing more and more of my original copy up to snuff with the changes because at the very least, my, you know, my optimism in Eclipse second edition is that they seem to know what they're doing in terms of the balance fixes, in terms of the changes to the numbers under the hood. Even if I have some misgivings about the new graphic design, the new game trays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as far as, as changing the game, they seem to be doing a great job. So I got to play Eclipse with all of the expansions and still have the second edition rules, which to me is the best of all possible worlds. All right, and that's the games we played this week. And now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Saw an interesting Kickstarter called Frontier Wars. Yet another game based on World War II with lots of miniatures and a hex system. And looks like there's going to be multiple players. I don't know how they're going to deal with this, whether it's just going to be a pseudo two-player game or not. But it looks very interesting. So I'm looking forward to seeing how it develops with all the stretch goals. It's about World War II and it's called Frontier Wars? It, It totally is. Sure. I know, right? So I read something that made me very, very happy, and it seemed to make the news people over at Board King Geek ha- very happy as well based on the way that they framed it. It would appear that Rio Grande Games is making a push to, you know, be a thing again. I, I've commented in the past that it seems like for the past few years they've contented purely to publish the occasional Tom Lehman expansion project and pretty much nothing else. This is in part because they've sold off their rights to a whole bunch of things, and they really seem to be winding down, which is a shame because when I entered the hobby – it was Rio Grande and Mayfair, and those were the two big publishers that were in the you know in the Euro space. But Mayfair is no longer, and Rio Grande looks like it's coming back in. It's announced, they've announced a bunch of new titles for 2019. None of them in particular caught my eye, but you know the fact that they're they're re-entering the market in a big way makes me very very happy. And there's one thing that they plan on publishing this year that caught your eye as well. And that is namely the the Roll for the Galaxy expansion. You want to talk about that? Yeah, there's a new expansion for Roll for the Galaxy called Rivalry. It's where you get to, like, pop out your dice, the standard, you know, little discs that you push into customizable dice. So that looks interesting, even though I felt as though the dice eventually didn't really matter in Roll for the Galaxy because you manipulate them so much that it really didn't matter, at least in my eye. But maybe this will change it up a bit. It seemed like there were a lot more powerful di- dice sides, so we'll see how that goes. I was a little bit dubious about the overall approach to the expansion, to be honest. They say there's going to be three different modules that you can mix and match, and it's going to be very expensive because they say that, you know, these three modules by themselves constitute more material than already exists in the base game plus the current expansion ambition. And then maybe it would have cost more to release the modules separately for the consumer, but I probably would have preferred that. I mean, maybe they'll get fewer sales. Maybe they would get fewer sales that way. But quite frankly, when a new expansion comes with a whole bunch of modules, I, it, it's kind of like getting a new Kickstarter that had too many stretch goals at the same time. It's not that I'm dubious that they, were, that they weren't playtested properly. It's that I don't know where to start. I don't know what to introduce. It kind of fragments the player base. So I, I, I wish that they'd release things in a more regular way, but I'm happy to see more support for the game. Well, the 35th anniversary of Battletech is coming up and the catalyst is going to put a new like base game of BattleTech. So to me that is exciting. I love BattleTech. If they do a great job on this, maybe we'll have like a small little revival and we can get some cool games of BattleTech in. Who knows? We'll see. It's only been 35 years. Yeah, only 35 years. It's the game the game seems much more ancient and dated than that in my mind. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> Roll 2d6 to hit. Roll 2d6 for hit location. Oh well. I hit your head, you're gone. <laughs> Anyway, (laughs) no offense to... I mean, look, I played Battletech 2. I was 12. That's right. (laughs) One final note from me on an editorial policy. Every week I had planned to talk about this, and then I pushed it back, figuring, oh, no, I don't need to waste anyone's time. But then every week there was a new reason for me to bring it up. I would like to now formally, once and for all, put to bed our editorial standards about pronunciation. I made a crack last week. Uh, about not caring about the pronunciation of someone's name, I would like to officially retract that because when it comes to pronunciation, the only thing that I actually care about is pronouncing names and places because those actually influence, you know, people. But if you want to tell me that I'm pronouncing corollary wrong because you've only ever heard it pronounced one way and so therefore anyone who pronounces it a different way must be wrong, we don't want to hear about it and we don't care. That is our policy on pronunciation. If we mispronounce a place, by all means... Let us know how to pronounce it properly, and we will do our level best to pay our due respect to people and places. I don't care if you're a linguist who's done field work, and you can say for certain that no one else in the world pronounces things this way. You're probably still wrong. Uh, so just accept the fact that we probably have a different dialect than you do, and move on. 
The only bit, other bit thing I want to talk about was these right rolls, roll and rights or cards and right. This is the new thing, apparently. There's about 12 been announced and six just came out and it's going to be the new greatest thing and I've yet to even play one. Oh, other than let's welcome make to. a... Or welcome to and let's make a bus route, right? Those let's roll. make a bus route is a roll and right? Well, it's, it is a right, right? Sure. There's cards and right, roll and right. There's okay. all sorts of way, different ways to do it. I had thought that I had never played anyone, but I guess you're right. Let's make a bus route does... I mean, it's basically the same. You get a random result and that tells you to draw something. So I guess, you, yeah, sure. And, and just some swag news, the... Our, we're going to be starting a new segment next week, which is the Bahamas Beach segment. It has nothing to do with the new Patreon, so don't worry about that. Yeah, we were considering Cuba, but there's a pesky matter of extradition, so right. uh, Bahamas... I hope the waves won't be too loud on the, on the, on the audio equipment. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the news and why it didn't matter. Now on to the feature game. Gloomhaven. I'm sure no one's heard of this game before. No, we're going to be the very first to talk about it. I'm very sure. This is like on the cusp of board game news. We are we are slaves to the hotness. That's right. Look, here's the deal. Here, here Here's one of the reasons why I think it's worth talking about it. Number one, I, I remember someone telling me an old adage in, in publishing, which is there are two reasons to talk about something. One is that nobody's talking about it. The other is that everyone's talking about it. And one of our listeners actually showed up in the, the guild on Board Game Geek and said, where are their thoughts on Gloomhaven? I can't find it anywhere. And sure enough, a number of people showed up and said, oh, yeah, yeah, no, they've talked about it before. And no, we haven't. The only the only time we've ever talked about Gloomhaven was actually during our 2017 year in review. Yeah, honestly, I, I you know brought up our you know speaker thread and went, like, went down. It's like, oh, I'll just link them the, the episode number. I'm going down, going down. It's like, oh, I guess we haven't done Gloomhaven yet. Right, right. And I think also we're in a we're in a somewhat unique position because well not not a somewhat unique position but we have a particular uh, stance from which to discuss the game because we've played Gloomhaven a lot I've got in excess of sixty recorded plays but I haven't played in a long time and I think that those two things in conjunction uh, are, are are worth mentioning but anyway let's let's first talk about the uh, the sort of history of this game. Which is somewhat strange. I was actually, I, I had a vague recollection of this because I find this an interesting fact. Gloomhaven, number one game of all time on Board Game Geek, regularly out of print because people keep buying all the printings as fast as they can. Talked about all the time in many different contexts, still on the hotness on Board Game Geek. Do you know how much money it raised during its first Kickstarter walker? Some ridiculously low amount, I'm sure. Three hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars is what it raised. Because he, he, here's why I mentioned this: not that I think that the amount of money that's raised on Kickstarter is indicative of anything in particular, but when Kingdom Death Monster, for example, uh, showed up on Kickstarter and and it went completely out of control and raised in excess of a million dollars back when that meant something. When a Seamon project shows up and raises a million bucks or a couple million bucks, and then you're flooded with a tremendous amount of content when it launches, that is a certain kind of thing. But when Gloomhaven raised under $400,000, and yet it still shipped a coffin full of material, that's a different kind of madness. That is a creator who didn't know when to stop. That was somebody who had enough passion for this project that they really put the time and effort into it. Because now, con- in, in contemporary terms, if something raises less than $400,000, you don't expect a tremendous amount of context in the box. We just come to, to, to peg content with number of stretch goals and stretch goals with amount of, of, of money. And even then, we expect it to be in the seven digits. You understand where I'm coming from with this? 100%. So I think it's worth reminding ourselves that this this thing, this weird artifact, in some ways is throwback to – well, not even a throwback. It's just it's, – it's in violation of a lot of the assumptions that we have about how Kickstarter projects work. And I mention this primarily because it doesn't really have uh, the publisher and the designer of Gloomhaven, Isaac Childress, who I'm, whose name I'm probably mispronouncing. And if I am, please let me know. Didn't really have much of a publishing pedigree. The, for, the one thing he did before that was Forge War, also self-published, which was an okay worker placement type of type of game. And uh, the only thing he's published since has been Founders of Gloomhaven, which is a little divisive in a lot of circles. It's certainly divisive locally. I haven't played it. I don't really have any interest in it. But Gloomhaven really stands apart in that it is not a Euro management game, unlike his other things. Yeah, apparently it's the best thing ever. Walker, is it the best thing ever? Best thing ever. Okay. Well, that's, that's Gloomhaven. That's Gloomhaven, no. And it really is depending on what you're looking for, right? If We'll talk about more of this later. Absolutely. I don't want to go into it too much because it's a part of the, the topic. In Gloomhaven, you are entering a unique world. It casts off all the usual suspects. No elves, no dwarves, no orcs. 
It gives you an entirely new experience. There's political intrigue. There's racial bias. There's social drama. There's hidden agendas. All of this in one box. This huge campaign that you and your friends can go on. It is a fantastic experience. Okay, well, let's start with that then, because right off the bat, I think that we appreciate Gloomhaven in different ways, which doesn't surprise me because we're very different kinds of gamers. I definitely appreciate the fact that it is not yet another iteration of Tolkien-derived nonsense. That I appreciate a tremendous deal, but I don't really care much about the world and I don't really care much about the plot. Some of the races are kind of interesting. Uh, Some of the different characters that it introduces are kind of interesting. But overall, all the narrative bits struck me as not tedious, but not exactly adding a whole lot of value to the proposition. But it sounds like you've you've had a different experience. No, I did. I like how it all intertwined and how there was like things happening in the city. And you knew even when you're off doing an adventure, there was back, you know, back room deals happening while you were away because you got back and things have changed and things were going on even though you weren't there. I thought they did a very good job of of making the city come to life. It is the case that there are lots of city events and road events and the variety there is interesting. One thing that it did uh, that I, that I quite appreciated was it would have the same setup on a variety of different event cards, but different results based on what you chose to do. Uh, You know, one example, very, very mild spoilers. When you're on the road, you can decide to eat some berries on the road. And, you know, at at one point we thought, oh, we've seen this card before. We know th- these are great berries. Eat the berries. No, no, no. There are different berries. There are different cards with the same setup text, just to keep things, uh, just to keep things interesting and give you some variety. That having been said, though, again, I it it didn't seem to do as much for me as it did for you in terms of the narrative of the thing. Just on that same topic, though, before we go too far, is. There's not really any spoilers here. In Gloomhaven, you're taking characters and you're retiring them and you're getting new characters. And when you retire a character, you're adding these the travel cards that we talked about. You're adding travel cards from that character into the travel deck. So now you can encounter that character or it changes the story somehow. And I thought that was a fantastic idea. I think it's a great idea. I agree with you. And it's really, really cool. And when that card pops up, it's a really, really neat thing because you remember your character. Uh, I did, however, feel that it robbed me a certain amount of my own narrative agency in the game. Because when playing Gloomhaven, I, I would develop what's called a headcanon. You know, imagining my character's aspirations. And uh, in part because the game, when you make a new character in Gloomhaven, you get a goal card, which is what that character wants to do. People in Gloomhaven don't kick down doors and murder things on the other side purely to take their stuff. They do that for very specific reasons. Uh, You know, they have something they want to do. They have something they want to accomplish. And, you know, that that little bit of narrative I really did appreciate. Yeah, so like when you retired a character, in your mind's eye, you had him going off into the sunset, enjoying a great life in retirement. But when this card came up and told you otherwise, you felt as though, you know... It wasn't that specifically. It wasn't the fact that my character didn't retire happily. I can accept unhappy endings. Some of my favorite stories are desperately unhappy endings. What I didn't like, though, was that it started completing bits of my character's personality that flew in the face of what I'd imagined for them in my head. I would have rather that those events were a little bit more agnostic as to what kind of person uh, my character was. And that would have given me enough space to, to, to maintain my own narrative in my head. But point taken, maybe I was just overcome with disappointment that they, that they weren't happy and living a shiny, happy future in the Bahamas like we will. All right, so let's hit those final goal cards. Every time you start a new character, you get this final goal card, and it's going to give you like a little mission. Do this, do that. And when you've completed that finally, then that character retires, and it'll tell you which character you're going to open. And it's a totally brand new experience. You have no idea what they are. They're all in sealed boxes. And I thought that was a very interesting way to do it because the goal card sort of reflected the kind of character you're going to get. The quest to unlock new characters, for me personally, was one of the biggest driving forces to see what was new in the world. I didn't care too much what happened to the world. I didn't really care what happened to the city, but I wanted to see those next characters. I loved playing my characters, but I wanted them to retire so that I could see what was around the corner. Because this is going to segue into the the primary way that I appreciate Gloomhaven. Because Gloomhaven, not only was it our game of the year for 2017, but it's also one of my top 10 games of all time. And I think that Gloomhaven is an absolutely genius epic-making design. It's primarily because of the core card play. Every class has its own deck of cards. And you you don't have a randomized hand. You have a fixed hand of cards that let you do various abilities. And every round, you have to play a top action, A different card will give a bottom action, and one of those two will give you an initiative. And this, 
from just a hand of eight cards in some cases doesn't seem like a whole heck of a lot of variety, but the amount of tactical and strategic trade-offs that you can make in this framework is amazing. And the amount of variety and detail that the designer has given to the very many different classes through this simple metric is amazing. No class has any inherent abilities at all. There's nothing inherent to any of the classes. It's all in their cards and well, they all, they also have hit point values, but it's not like anybody has a baseline special ability. It's not like Mage Knight, where you might upgrade something and you get these skill tiles. And now you have something outside your cards. No, 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 it's still all just your cards. And I initially thought that that was going to lead to sort of narrow horizons. Like, okay, how much difference is it going to be? This guy moves three, this other one moves four, who cares? But it's not like that at all. The amount of detail is tremendous. Yeah, I have that here, here as well, that uh, all the cards are good. So, like, when you're trying to decide which ones to take out, it's almost impossible because they all have great abilities and the fact that they group together in certain combos. And if, like, okay, well, well, that one's not so good, but if I take out that one, then this one's not as good. And then it's, like, does this cascading effect. Well, this one sort of works with this one as well. And it's just this great deck-building part of the game that brings back, you know, this, you know that, that joy of deck-building as well. My first two characters, and in some ways I didn't really appreciate this until the third character I played. My first two characters were relatively straightforward. They, one of them was a, a relatively straightforward damage dealer. The other one was a relatively straightforward tank with support elements. But the third one that I picked, you really had to make it work. It's not that it was a, it was a weak class. It wasn't even that it was particularly difficult. It's that it wasn't as straightforward from the get-go. Here you are. Here's your pigeonholed role, which to a certain extent was me underestimating the game. And so I really had to look for those combos to work. I had to set things up. And in those contexts, I really got to see more of the gears working in satisfying ways. And it ended up being one of my favorite characters to play simply because it really showed the card system going to work. Not only that, but much like other fantasy games, you can specialize in something. So this guy can be like either a, a healer or he can like inflict pain onto the enemy. You know what I mean? And you can like take different paths and specialize. And I thought they did a great job with that. The other aspect of the card management that is really, really, really clever is how you lose cards. Because you have a very, as we say, we have a very small number of cards. And generally speaking, you can cycle them back at relatively small opportunity cost. But the big opportunity cost is cards will leave your hand permanently for the rest of the scenario. It, it's, it represents your exhaustion is what it is. You do have a separate health track, but your your deck size is different for every type of character. And this is how, how exhausted it takes them to be kicked out of the game. So you get rid of cards when you rest, which lets you pull up all your discards. You get rid of cards to ignore damage, so it's another way to take hits. And also in one of the, the things that, again, initially I wasn't a huge fan of, but I got to appreciate more and more I played, was some cards have a more powerful effect that once they happen, they're out of the game forever. And what this does, I've, t I've talked a lot about how I like games to have a sense of tempo, a sense of, a sense of an arc. You really do get the sense as you bust down that final door into the final boss encounter or the final room or what have you. You're exhausted. You've taken damage. You've taken wounds. Some of your deck is gone. But now, if, you, if you've played correctly or if you've played the way the game seems to want to encourage you to play, you've saved your most powerful effects for last. And it explodes into this orgy of powerful effects which are really impressive. And so it lends itself in a very natural, organic way to a sort of climactic final showdown where you unleash your most powerful effects in response to your most powerful so powerful foes. Again, under the aegis, Gloomhaven is a relatively complicated game and there's a lot in there, but the core card play is bone simple. And yet it exerts so much texture and nuance, it's amazing. Which is fantastic because it's not random either. Because like I said, you have an exhaustion level. And that's how big your deck is, and you start with that entire deck in your hand. There's no, like, oh, I didn't get the cards I need. You get all of your cards at the beginning. You choose which ones you're going to play, and that's one of the other parts that is fantastic about this game. I'm just going to talk about how how it just sort of starts up. Like, at the beginning, it says, you know, you're in the town, and then, you know, you're given these quests, you have these choices, and you're going to put these stickers on the map, which are great, and you go out, and it'll say, set up the map a certain way, and there's hundreds of map tiles. You can have almost any layout you could possibly imagine. And the way the rule book uh, tells you where to put the monsters and how many monsters there are based on the number of players is a fantastic system. It has, like, these colored bars around it. It's quick, simple, and easy, within reason. <laughs> yeah, we'll, more we'll on get this to, later. More on this that, later. This yeah. being said, I'm I'm not I'm not going to have any bad points during the segment. All my bad points for Gloomhaven will be during the next part. Oh, I've got some bad points in here. Well, That's we'll fine. You can. I'm, uh, for mine, I, I'm going to say. I have your permission, sir. You do. So then, 
then, like we said, you've populated the map and you put your characters at the entrance and then you're, you put the monsters out and off you go. You put down your two cards. Whoever has the lowest initiative will go first. And then the monsters all flip up cards and they also have an initiative and off you go. And the monster AI system is fantastic. It again, it's one of those things that's really, really simply done. Every monster type has a deck of eight cards. And again, the natural, when I was initially, you know, dealing with all this stuff, because there's so much stuff in the box, it's an expensive game, but nobody, I've, I haven't heard anyone claim you don't get more than your money's worth in the context of the box. And it's just eight cards. I wasn't expecting much variety or detail or nuance. But again, it's the same as the character ability cards. You get these marvelously clever little flourishes. Fire elementals will take damage if there's ambient ice in the air based on the way the AI system works. And it's very, very simple. You just pull up a card and you do exactly what it, what it tells you to do. But you get this very interesting stuff and you get so much monster differentiation. It's not just that the classes all feel different. The monsters feel different. Now, some of them aren't particularly uh, stunningly original. You know, a bandit will, is, is probably just going to run up and whack you. And there's a couple of other monsters that are more or less going to run up and whack you. But even in that context, there are slight little differences. Skeletons feel like skeletons. Oozes do nasty stuff and split. Yeah, which leads to, to my point that I was going to make next. Some of the monsters actually have strategies that you need to employ in order to kill them, like the oozes. you got to, like, let them multiply because you know that card's there and then quickly, you know, deal with them before that card comes up again and makes them split all over again. And not only is there an AI deck for every monster, but every monster comes with a large card that has four different slots and they slide into these sleeves. You can hear my voice slowly getting sensual because this is fantastic. So you wrote, you, you, you turn the monster card, depending on what level of monster you want to do, and it slides into these sleeves that have little pie slate pie shapes on them. Walker lights a couple scented candles. He makes us all leave the room. He puts on the berry white and then he slowly. Slowly. Yeah. So, and, and the sleeve has all the monsters on it. So as you're playing the game, it has all the little monster standees have numbers on them and little pie things on your little sleeve has the numbers there. So as they take damage, you, or status effects, you put them all in the little pie shapes on the monster card and it works so wonderfully. It's amazing. Yeah, it works great for you because you never have to bother with it because I have to deal with all of it. Yeah, I let my secretary deal with that. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, to, so to a certain extent, this is going to be touching on things that we're going to talk about next segment. But let me let me tell you this as far as advice on how to run Gloomhaven properly. You need to make sure that your fellow players don't get lazy like my friends did. The number of times where people would point to something on the board and say, how many hit points does this monster have left? And my response was, you can figure that out yourself. You have access to the same information that I do. And then the response to that is, oh, well, I was thinking about what I wanted to do during my turn. And then I lose my mind and start bashing my head against the wall. Yes, yes, yes. I understand you're trying to speak English, but all I can hear is, me, 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 me. People do have to pull their own weight, <laughs> suffice to say. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that later. But just don't find yourself drafted in the role of Gloomhaven Secretary and Gloomhaven Overlord. I will have to 100% agree with you. We, we took you for granted, that is for sure. And that is one of the reasons why we haven't played in so long. One of them is that uh, not everyone in our, our local group, uh, Huey actually is not a fan of Gloomhaven for a variety of reasons, some of which we'll actually uh, touch on in a moment. But... I just got sick and tired of having to be the one responsible for all the overhead and upkeep. It was mentally draining, and I still enjoyed it even when I was running everything. I've played Gloomhaven solo. It's surprisingly fun with some of the the, the solo scenarios. Running two different characters, not so much. I don't recommend that necessarily. So the extent to which Gloomhaven is a solo experience, I think, has been exaggerated. Well, at least for for my tastes. I, I like lots of solo games. I solo many games, but Gloomhaven doesn't do it for me, except for some of the solo scenarios. And even then, those are more like puzzles than anything else. Uh, they're available online. There's been tremendous aftermarket, aftermarket support, by the way, for Gloomhaven. Lots of community campaigns where the designer has asked people on the forum to collectively decide where to go next and special scenarios being released. All that kind of stuff has been marvelous. And this is on top of the fact, and we can't stress this enough, that there's near endless content in this box. Yeah, I'm just going to say there's one thing I forgot. It. Hundreds of adventures all linked together in this huge overarching story. It's fantastic. And that's even ignoring the fact that there is a one-shot scenario setup deal where you can randomly gen- generate a scenario on the fly or replay past scenarios with all new characters or whatever. Now, I will say that 
the rate at which the campaign experience introduces new things is darn near perfectly calibrated, I think. The rate at which new scenarios become unlocked, you, you're, not, you're, you're, you're almost never forced to replay a scenario unless you lose, which is great. So there's always new scenarios to try. The rate at which new characters introduced is generally pretty good. The rate at which people level up is difficult, but definitely attainable. You always feel like there's some new stuff to unlock. And whether you're whether you're, uh, you find the narrative unlocks appealing like Walker does or whether you just like the mechanical unlocks like I do, there's stuff to be had because, again, there's just so much stuff. Speaking of so much stuff, there's stuff we haven't talked about yet. Like there's an attack deck. And this all goes into your player sheet as well. So everyone comes with like a standard player deck. Every time you say, I'm attacking something, you flip up a card. And there's a one catastrophic miss in there, and then there's a critical, and there's all sorts of other modifiers and bonuses. But as you go through different adventures, on your player sheet, there's a way to, you know, tick off things, and you have a whole separate deck that you're going to feed into this attack deck that is going to give you more status effects or more damage or more just yet something else to customize. I think they did a fantastic job. The fact that you can customize your modifier deck and that it is so different based on different classes is is marvelous. However, and this I think is a, is a segue into one of my biggest negatives about Gloomhaven. The w- the primary way that you unlock new stuff for your character deck is well one of them is by leveling up and when you level up you get all kinds of different things, new cards and and more hit points and all that kind of stuff. But the other way you do it is by scenario based goals. Your character has an overall overall overarching retirement goal. They also have a different goal at the beginning of every scenario. And these goals are designed explicitly to be semi-competitive, and you're not allowed to talk about them. Both of these two axes, I think, are borderline obnoxious, if not downright silly. And that's one of the things that a lot of people don't like about Gloomhaven. This introduces a whole bunch of weird incentives and strange anti-cooperative nonsense and it's clear that the designer wanted things to be that way. He's very, very clear in the rulebook about how, you know, this is supposed to introduce friction and tension into the game. I don't really want that in those contexts. And my biggest beef, if anything, and I'd like to hear your opinion on it, are the ridiculous communication restrictions that permeate every element of Gloomhaven. It's not just your goals. Because when you get your goal, you're not supposed to say, oh, I want to do this thing because that's my goal. Everyone back off. Because if you could do that, that would be fine. I would have no problem with it. But you're also not allowed to say specific things about what you're going to do in the coming turn when you're planning your action. You can't say, oh, I'm going to go do five damage to that thing. You're supposed to say, I'm going to go and hit that thing pretty hard. And it's going to be pretty early in the initiative queue. And sure. Well, what I feel is that I think during playtesting, they thought that overanalyzing every fight made it way easier. So you just probably maybe cut back on it a bit. If you know exactly when you're going to attack and interrupt them from doing any damage and and perfectly planning out every turn, probably uh, leaned it too easy for the players. And instead of just trying to rebalance everything, just cut back on the communication and therefore fix it up. But I do want to quickly go back to on those... Uh, On those goal cards, I was thinking while we were talking that that would be the one negative I was talking about too. And mostly just because it felt so out of place with the rest of the game. It's like, here's all this like really cool stuff. And then do, 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 here's your two goal cards. Start saying silly stuff like, oh, is it okay if I open that door? (laughs) Just silly stuff like that. And I thought it was out of place. And therefore, like we talked about before, it takes you out of the experience, right? It's like... You know, you, you've got this cool cool story, you're going into this dungeon, and then you're given these silly cards that, you know, will just pull you out of the game. I agree 100%. The, so my beef with the communication rules, it's exactly the same way that I felt about other games that have them. Like, for example, Shadows over Camelot, where you're allowed to say things, but you can't be too precise. So there are, you know, good reasons at the time for that. It's It's just kind of ridiculous. Now, either it encourages you to engage in dumb memory shenanigans where you're expected to internalize what everyone else is doing or just accept the fact that there's a level of opacity going over the proceedings. And I don't mind just letting there be a certain level of opacity going over the proceedings. But to a certain extent, you have to communicate what you're going to do over the course of the turn. It's inevitable. It's a co-op game where you're all planning cards at the same time. People are going to ask you questions, and I don't want to have to think, well, what do the rules say? Am I allowed to say about the thing that I'm going to do in my turn? And sometimes it just leads to ridiculousness. For example, when we were playing early on, there was a character who we knew in our group, their fastest action was a seven. 
We just knew that it was a seven because it came up all the time because it was really fast. And so we play out actions and, and, and the character would say, oh, yeah, I'm going to be going really fast. Like, OK, seven, because we just remembered. Yeah. And <laughs> I don't like it when I'm encouraged to develop heuristics and nonsense and double talk. I just I, I, I find it terrible. I much rather would uh, I, I would be much, much more pleased if the designer had actually rebalanced things, allowing for that kind of communication or. I mean, theoretically, he could have just said, you're not allowed to say what you're going to do during over the course of the turn. That's fine, too. Like, there are co-op games where you're just not allowed to tell people what you're going to do. And that I find much cleaner, sometimes less satisfying, but at least much cleaner and le- encouraging less uh, less silliness than just the sort of, well, you can kind of describe what you're going to be doing, but you can't be precise about it. And ugh, ugh, don't right. like it. Let me just blow over some of the quick things that I have left. There's very few here. Uh, like when you go into the city, you have a full flushed out city, you can, you know, aid the city. And every time you do that to a certain level, you're going to be putting these banner stickers on, which give you even more effects. I thought that was cool. You can go get blessings before every fight. Not, uh, well, before every time you go to an adventure, which adds these, you know, critical hits to your, your hit deck. I thought that was interesting. And I thought the last thing is status effects. In lots of games, they have status effects. You know, you're stunned, you're bleeding, you're whatever. And a lot of them are silly and uh, overly complicated and slow the game down. And I felt in Gloomhaven, none of these things applied. I thought they are very basic and easy to remember and use. And they're very judicious about paralyzing characters. And most classes, if they're clever, are able to overcome some of the more unfortunate status effects, like being immobilized. Being immobilized stinks. It's awful. But again, if you're able to – if your deck is full or if you happen to know – what's coming, or if you're fighting something that you know mobilizes you, you can make sure, even if you're normally a melee class, to be able to deal with that. And paralysis, which is basically skip a turn, that almost never happens to heroes. Heroes can sometimes inflict it to other monsters. That's fine. When you get 12 monsters on the board, paralyzing a couple of them is A-OK. Uh, but you're right. The, the status effects are, again, varied and relatively straightforward. Tracking who has what, a little bit more complicated, but we'll probably get to that later. Uh, but you talked a little bit about money. Uh, just as a minor note, this is this is a, about a, a series of decisions that have been made. This isn't a criticism. Equipment doesn't matter a whole heck of a lot in Gloomhaven. I've, I've tended to notice in fantasy adventure games, you tend to have games where equipment tends to be the majority of what your character constituted, and then there are games where your character is really defined by other things, not equipment, and then there's some that are a bit of balance of both. And in Gloomhaven, it's mostly your character cards. That's that's the the the, the major element. Your equipment is just minor buffs here and there. Most of them you just get to use once per adventure anyway. But one of the salient problems about gold is, again, that's one of the areas where the game wants – seems to want to introduce some interparty tension because gold is kept private and it is never shared amongst anybody. You can't give gold to other party members. You can't give equipment to other party members. You're just not allowed. That's probably partially a balance reason. Maybe it's also partially a thematic reason. I don't like it. When Again, when there's a co-op game, I want to know with greater clarity what it is that I'm allowed to say to my other, uh, the other people sitting around the table, and I'd much rather be able to share resources. I understand why it's there, but I, I wish it wasn't. So in sum, I, I think it's fair to say that when it comes to fantasy adventure combat, I've certainly never seen it done nearly as well as Gloomhaven has done it. Is that true of you? 100%. And this is something that's been done for decades. This is the the kind of genre has been done to death. And Gloomhaven really has set the new standard, I think, in terms of clever ways to do it, sheer variety of effects, and for some people as well, a richly fleshed out narrative on top of it. But it's just so clever in so many ways. And just the sheer variety and ingenuity combined in one package definitely means that Gloomhaven, I think, deserves its acclaim and deserves its its vaunted status amongst the elite of board games. 100%. Even now, I think it is still one of the best. And that is Gloomhaven. Now on to the topic of the week, which is how much should a game demand of its players? Or how how much can a game demand of its players? I mostly want to talk about this because it's just so different. A lot of these topics I enjoy because it's so different in, in different groups, right? You have groups that only have one or two games. You have a and d group that suddenly wants to play a board game. You have, you know, groups like ours, which gets, you know, wants to play the newest thing all the time. So when these games come out, how much time or effort can they demand of these players well what do you think let's start with gloomhaven let's start with gloomhaven because we haven't you know talked about gloomhaven yet so we haven't 
Uh, we, sure, we surely did an episode in 2017 about it. I think so. Oh. Huge setup. Tons of components. You got to pull all of this stuff out. If you're only going to play one adventure, you're wasting your time. You have to be able to at least make sure you're sitting down for at least two or three, at least a three-hour block in order to make it worthwhile of opening up this giant box with all of the components. Not only that, in order to get through the whole campaign, it's at least 50 sessions. At least, minimum. Right? And in this new age of playing the newest thing, are you going to be able to play this one game 50 times? And it really does ask you, it really helps to have the same players playing the game as well. So that's another point that we're going to, I'm going to go over multiple times is games that demand you to have the same players there over and over again. Well, let me just sort of as the, the, the final capper to our review of Gloomhaven, I will say that Gloomhaven Partially because, personally, I wasn't very invested in the narrative. I don't mind not finishing a Gloomhaven campaign because I don't see it pointing towards some sort of ultimate conclusion other than seeing everything. But I know I'm never going to see anything, so I'm fine. You know, I I, I, I want to play Gloomhaven more because I want to play Gloomhaven no- more, not because I think that the campaign needs to end. Contrast that with our experience with Scythe Rise of Fenris, where it's like, well, let's just finish this stupid campaign and get it over with. Or- that's That's a different story entirely. Exactly. Or another game I'm going to talk about at the end. But and again, in terms of social obligation, I, I absolutely agree with you. I We've talked about this before. One of the worst things about campaign games is turning a game into a societal obligation where you have to be there to finish everything. Gloomhaven, again, does things relatively well. You can have players swap in and out far, far more easily in Gloomhaven than you can with lots of other games. Even than say, Kingdom Death Monster, where you're typically not playing a single character, it's more difficult to have people swap in and out of a settlement because they need to be brought up to date with what's happened and what the settlement can do and what new resources have been acquired. Whereas in Gloomhaven, you could just show, I could show up to anybody's campaign, be told what the new minimum level is and say, okay, well, give me 10 minutes. I'll give you, a, I'll, I'll come up with a, a level four character and we're off to the races. So that is, that is one way in which it's better than a lot of these other campaign driven things. I have the same thing as in Pandemic Legacy. Same thing. They expect you to pay, play 12 to 24 games and you really should play with the same number of people. And that is a lot of investment for one game. Yeah. And sometimes it just doesn't seem worth it. And then you're left with this sunk cost fallacy whereby you feel compelled. Again, like, like the campaign of Rise of Fenris. We don't – we like – we don't particularly object to all the new stuff that's in New Rise of Fenris, so, although you know we have different agreements about that. But I know that I think I should play the last two scenarios, but I'm hard-pressed to say why. <laughs> because they're there, just like the mountain. <laughs> exactly. One thing I like to flag is, and, and I've been thinking about this a little bit, is what kinds of moods and environments – can games expect people to put up with? We've been flagging uh, objectionable representations of women in in art, for example, and that's one thing that I'm not willing to put up with much anymore. For what it's worth, Gloomhaven is pretty good, uh, especially as far as the, the, the fantasy genre is concerned. I mean, some people are dressed in not exactly realistic ways, but overall you don't see a prevalence of chainmail bikinis or stuff like that, so that that's at least one thing. There's uh, lots of RPGs, for example, that rely heavily on the mood. Most of the RPGs that I like to play now are mostly about bad things happening to bad people. Things like Durant's, things like Fiasco. I know a lot of people aren't looking for that when it comes to their gaming environments. This came up also when we were talking about uh, possibly trying Nyctophobia. We haven't played Nyctophobia, but in Nyctophobia you're supposed to play with blindfolds on. People are supposed to play with a blindfold on when they play When I Dream. And a lot of people, and I'm not picking on them specifically, but... Some people get very, very uncomfortable with not being able to see their surroundings in a public space. And that's reasonable. Uh, you know, you feel very vulnerable. You feel very... You feel, Claustrophobia? You feel... Yeah. Same you, thing with uh, When I Dream, right? When you put that blindfold on, right? People are not sure what's going on around you, right? Yeah, exactly. And we're talking about, you know, not, not putting too fine a point on it, but there are certainly people who already feel nervous in public environments anyway for any number of reasons. And compounding that with this additional sense of vulnerability and, and exposure uh, is certainly something I can understand people not wanting to do. And that's one of the reasons why I tend to be very, very selective about who I'm going to play games like that with. Because I know that most people, when they want to play games, they want a, you know, a fun experience. And we've commented before, we don't necessarily expect games to be fun in a, in a traditional sense. But that's mostly because we play so many games. And a lot of people just want that. It's just like it's like people who uh, only watch movies and TV for escapism and don't want to watch anything dark. I respect that. Games can be the same way. Agreed. Another quick game, 
is Twilight Struggle, where they where it almost definitely needs you to know the decks of cards, right? Is that too much to expect from a game where you have to know what cards are coming up? You have to know what to expect. You have to know both the decks, not only yours, but also your opponent's and what cards he's used and what you might be hit with later. So I've been thinking, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this under the aegis, the general aegis of games where your first play, you're not really going to be able to get much traction. And it's not just games like Twilight Struggle, even much lighter games like Blue Moon, for example. Blue Moon, the first couple times you play it, it you're not really going to feel like you have a whole heck of a lot of control over your own destiny because you don't know the composition of the decks. A similar thing is true of Race for the Galaxy. Your first couple of uh, plays, you're going to be awash in icons because you're learning a new language from scratch. And my standard is is not so much how many games does it take for you to become proficient. Because I'm happy with any number. Honestly, I like games where you're equally proficient from your first play. You know, things like Rhino Heroes, Hero Super Battle, or uh, games like Skull or Cockroach Poker. Some people just take to that immediately, and there's no real skill horizon for them. They just take to it naturally because they're ciphers. That's all well and good. I also like games where it takes at least double-digit plays for you to become tr- truly proficient. My standard is different. My standard is how many game, how many plays does it take before the game is engaging? before you feel like you're, you've got some sort of hook, either mechanically, thematically, narratively, or anything else. And for me, that number is one. You get one shot. <laughs> if Maybe that's me being incredibly superficial. But after, the, after a first play, if a player, not necessarily me, says, I found nothing about this engaging, it left me completely unengaged, I don't think it's reasonable to say, oh, but you have to play it three more times before you really... It's like, no, there are games everywhere that are engaging in the first play, whether you're good at them or not. I'm not going to feel comfortable telling somebody they need to sink another N sessions into something before they recognize that it's it's a worthwhile product. Does that make sense? It totally. In the case of Twilight Struggle, I will point out that all things being equal, it's good if there are little heuristics that you can point to. And in Twilight Struggle, when I teach people how to play that game, I'd say, look, you're going to do better if you know all the cards... But here are the scoring cards. You need to know the scoring cards. And you give them the player aid that, that gives all the scoring cards and say, just know for a fact that Europe's scoring is in from the get-go and that Africa and South American scoring show up in era two. And so if you can stage the information a little bit, I sometimes find that helpful. But you're right. It is a reasonable question to ask, is it the case that a game where you have to play it a couple times in order to become proficient, that's not going to be for everybody. I don't mind playing like a monkey until I know what I'm doing. But a lot of people have to feel differently. And that, that, that's fine. The other thing I have here is the massive time sink, like games like TI4 or these huge games that take, you know, huge amounts of time. There seems to be this big push for little smaller games. I'm wondering if these, you know, games that take, you know, four or five hours are being pushed out. I don't know. I think if anything, the past the past few years to me has actually been a push towards longer, heavier stuff, honestly. I mean, if you look at the Board Game Geek Top 10, for example, it used to consist of games like... Puerto Rico and Tigers and Euphrates and Power Grid and things like that. And longer games, like your war games, your multi-hour consens, like even Demoker, for example, which has been around since more or less forever as far as the hobby is concerned, uh, they weren't in the top 10. They were very well respected, but they didn't dominate the top 10. Now you see more and more much longer, heavier games, like Gloomhaven, for what it's worth. The rules overhead in Gloomhaven is not in, insubstantial. And as you said, when you factor in setup and teardown and everything else, you're, you're looking at more than two hours. So I, I don't know that longer games are getting pushed out. I think that people are recognizing that different situations call for different scenarios. I miss playing those quicker Euros like Han, but at the same time, I still want to get together a game of Cataclysm. I still want to get a, get, the game, uh, get together a game of La Révolution Française or Successors or Triumph and Tragedy or, or, or what have you. So, All right, and the last game I have on my list is uh, Discovery, Lands Unknown. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's Discover Lands Unknown, actually. D- Discover we've, Lands we've been Unknown, getting sorry. the name consistently wrong, in part because we can't help but wish it were different. Or, or the fact that we just don't care. There's that, too. And they expect their players not to understand what game mechanics are or what fun is. <laughs> and I really think that is pushing the envelope too far. <clears throat> Another barrier to entry <laughs> that I've been thinking about lately is actually Arts and Crafts. I've been doing a fair amount of board game related arts and crafts over the past few months. I, as I said, I made an entire new set of Sacker Arms to bring it up to the new balance changes. I've been stickering a whole bunch of Eclipse tiles, all those plasma mi- missile tech tiles I've been stickering on both sides. It's been very, very time consuming. And I am not good at arts and crafts. I hated arts and crafts ever since kindergarten. I'm actually okay with it. I- I've come to terms with the fact that I'm bad at it, can't cut a straight line. 
but I really like it in part because when I'm engaging in arts and crafts, I know that this is because the designer or the community has made something available to me. And I really respect that. So the balance changes in Root, for example. The, the, balance, the, the minor balance changes that have been introduced in the Root factions have been made available in high-quality PDF. So I was able to print it out in sticker paper and, and apply them. And is it unfortunate that I now have components that are kind of jury-rigged? Maybe, maybe not. But I at least respect the fact that the designer and the publisher were like, look, we've made these changes, but we want everyone to have them available to close to zero cost. That's good. That is support. Uh, I like the fact that the communities for Eclipse and Sacra Arms said, look, the publishers aren't doing what we want them to. So we're going to try to make sure that everyone can move forward using the new balance changes. And I like that. You know, kind of the same. It's not quite FOMO, but like knowing that there's a better version out there makes me not want to play the worst version. I want to have the latest best thing. And sometimes it's irrational, but I do appreciate that. So arts and crafts is definitely something I've had to dip my toe into. It's, it's, it's a sloppy term. Then there are some games where even right out the box, you have to apply considerable arts and crafts. Like, for example, the only game that matters, Seal Team Flicks. It took me hours to manufacture those boards. In hindsight, I'm not exactly sure whether that's a reasonable expectation for anyone to already plunk down a considerable cost and then spend that much time getting a game ready. I had every reason to suspect that we were going to really, really like it. Plus, we're professional board game journalists now. Exactly. Well, we weren't at the time. Before, we were amateur yahoos. Now we are professional yahoos. Oof. We should have business cards printed out to say exactly that. And so I, I, I knew I had to do and wanted to do it. But maybe it isn't reasonable to expect the average player or even the average hobbyist to sink that much time into, into assembling before playing a game. Because it's weird. One of the things that we used to say about miniatures gaming was that it was an entirely different thing because you had to assemble and paint and glue and trim and all this other stuff and base and all that other nonsense. But now it seems like, looking back, I've been spending more and more time doing stuff like that for non-miniatures games. And part of me is okay with that for the reasons that I've adduced, but part of me wonders if that's uh, that, that's going to be more pronounced going forward. I don't know. Who knows? I also assembled a, a, a big SDF-1 in, uh, in attack mode, so... It's- this is also true. Yeah. All these things. I've become the, – the things that – the skills that I've had to pick up in order to support my board game hobby are, are strange. Not that I'm good at any of these things, but – There's also a rules barrier. You had mentioned this previously in, in, dis, in discussion. Have, have, yeah, something like Advanced Squad Leader, right, where you got this giant binder of 500 pages that you have to get through in order to play. So I've never dipped my toe into ASL. I've wanted to. I'm not that much uh, – I, I mean, I, I do self-identify as a war gamer to a certain extent, but I, I'm not quite at, at the level of ASL. For one, I, I mean, there are no opponents for me anywhere n- nearby, so it would be a bit of a wasted effort. Uh, but I have been thinking about this lately because I've been trying to get through – trying to really internalize the rules for Cataclysm, which is something that I, I, I want to try coming up. And comparing it to other games of similar weight, to me it's not so much the length of the rule book. Because I think the longest rule book of any game that, I, that I've, I've played uh, a number of times and really like would probably be La Révolution Française, La Patrie en Danger. I think it's 1790-1796. The name of the game, Walker, what do you want? That is literally the name of the game. La Révolution Française, La Patrie en Danger. Besides, our listeners love it when I speak French. It, it makes them feel like you do when you slide those Gloomhaven oh, there you go. monsters into the, into the sleeves. And it's, it's, I think the rule book for La Révolution Française is about 60 pages long. But the thing is, is that just the nature of the game, it's not loaded with exception after exception after exception. So I know where to find things and I know how to look them up and I can be reasonably certain that I'm not messing everything up. Cataclysm, on the other hand, I, I, more on this later once we actually played the thing. I don't want to review it before playing it. But everything's got an exception. Everything has got an exception to an exception, and it's like this process pred- predominates unless it's raining on a Tuesday. There, honestly, I don't care how long your rule book is. Your rule book could be four pages. If everything is nested exceptions, I'm not going to be able to internalize the rules. So I think that rules grit, not necessarily rules length, but rules grit can be a significant barrier to entry. And there have been some games, certainly games on Kickstarter, where I start reading the rules and I'm like, nope, <laughs> too much grit. <laughs> and done. I, I know other games that, I, that, that won't burden me this way, so move on. It's weird. What we're willing to tolerate in terms of rules load, I think, can be very personal. And for me, it's the number and nature of exceptions and, and that, that kind of grip. A final thing is player count. Sometimes you can look at what a player count requires 
And you can just know that this isn't a game for you. This is What the game demands is not something you're going to be able to provide. For a time, for a very long time actually in my hobby life, if something needed more than – if something needed four or more players, I just knew it was a non-starter because I knew one or two people with whom I could play games and that was about it. Now, if anything, it's quite the opposite. If I see something as two-player only, pff, it's got to it's meet a very, very, very high bar. Then there are games like Sidereal Confluence that thrive with very, very large player counts and I'm having a difficult time – getting people there because, you know, people are dumb and they don't like sidereal confluence. They should be pitied rather than punished, but it's, it's true. just it's it's true. true. Similarly, there's uh, Secret Hitler. The the overwhelming popularity of Secret Hitler has meant that I am having difficulty getting the resistance to the table because games like that with large player counts, you know, the large social games where it can perfectly tolerate seven and ten people. The trick is, and one of the reasons why games like that have, have a barrier to getting the table, if there's one person who strongly dislikes the game, you're going to have a hard time getting it there because you need to get a large group, not including that one person. And sometimes that's a person you really like, and it makes it all the more unfortunate that they're completely wrong and don't like the resistance. So That, that, that player is terrible. I agree. Completely, completely awful. So I, I do think, though, that at the end of the day, looking back at the kinds of stuff that we've been willing to tolerate in order to get the games we love to be able to be played – we're talking about a lot of blood, sweat, and tears here. <laughs> it's, it's true. The things that you the, – the, the way you go out of your way to make it accessible to everyone and the, the, the sacrifices you make to a particular game in order to make it that way is, is staggering. Yeah, and it, it's strange that I don't look back with too much regret at a lot of the effort that I've put into to some of these things. I mostly just regret the games that I can't get to the table, not the games that I devoted significant effort to learning and assembling and then discovering I didn't like them, which is weird. I guess it's just I'm, I guess I'm just a masochist that way. Maybe. On that note, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, or you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care, everyone. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>